To speed up or not to speed up? That is the question that I'm gonna answer right now because Berserk for me has been one of the most enjoyable narrative rides to walk through with my audience. But I'm also aware that we're at such a slow pace that it's beginning to get a bit redundant. And I also have a lot of other mangas I wanna get to and I wanna keep this as enjoyable a ride from beginning to end as I possibly can. So I'm gonna be picking up the pace a good bit here with Berserk, still going through the narrative like I have been, just summarizing a bit more because there's a lot of mangas to get to and this one needs to get done. But that means I'm gonna be asking you to let me know what you think of the new pace in the comments down below, whether or not it feels appropriate. And if you'd like me to slow back down, I understand, or speed up even more. But in case you missed it, we had the results of the poll come in of which manga should be gone through in a deep dive next, and the two winners are Vinland Saga and Chainsaw Man. Just from my base impression of these two, they're pretty much as different as two mangas could get, but that's a good thing, that's great. And this weekend, you will be getting your first Chainsaw Man video, and Vinland Saga, you'll be getting your first video of Next week! So without any further ado, let us go ahead and finish Deluxe Edition Volume 6 and start Deluxe Edition Volume 7. Yeah, I mean it. We're picking up the pace! Picking up where we left off, we see that Puck is talking with Rickard, and they're largely discussing the emotional state of Guts. Rickard expresses appreciation for the fact that Guts has been returned to them, and in a somewhat similar emotional state than when he left, Rickard was afraid he would come back even worse shape than he was, and he largely credits Puck for giving them Guts in such a stable place. Stable for Guts, let's make that abundantly clear. Then we see the blacksmith come down and actually talk about the fact that he is going to reforge Guts's sword, as well as provide some additional equipment as well. This is just a clear metaphor for Guts, who is cracked and messed up on the surface, but is stronger within. Narrative metaphors, we love them here, yay. And then we see Guts getting this new equipment, which includes an even better arm, a reforged sword, and of course, better armor as a whole, and the aesthetic, if I may say. Magnificent. Guts asks Rickard if he knows anything that could line up in the area with the holy ground he saw in the vision of Casca he had, and he's pointed towards a massive refugee camp they're actually going to spend a lot of time with here for a while. But as Guts leaves, he says a quick goodbye to his companions there, and we see the old man remark, Huh, off he goes without even looking back. That's how it is with that fool. This might be our final parting, but you haven't even got the time to stop and acknowledge it. Well, it's a lot better than getting all gloomy. He turns and starts running towards something one way without noticing some other thing falling to the ground. It really is beyond our control, living and dying. And yeah, that's, that's Guts. Guts is just a force of nature who has a lot of thick blinders around him, but so it makes him a good protagonist for this world. But we cut to one month prior and we see the Holy Iron Chain Knights arriving at this refugee camp. And we get a brief political update that talks about the fact that they don't even know if Princess Charlotte and the other nobles are still alive after the invasion that's happened. Remember that we talked about that? There's an invasion going on. It's not the focus of the narrative though, background stuff. We also see due to her failure of having captured the Black Swords but then lost him, the leader of the Holy Iron Chain, Knights of the Holy See, all the titles here are very confusing. She has been demoted and is now being assigned to essentially being a bodyguard escort for some inquisitors. And we even see her internal struggle is growing quite a bit. She is going through it psychologically due to the demonic possession that happened to her and her encounter with Guts as a whole. And it makes sense that your average normal, not normal, your average religious zealot meeting Guts is going to have some life-changing experiences in that encounter. But the carriage she is escorting is gargantuan. And as it arrives, there's actually an ambush that's set because apparently these inquisitors have purged entire villages. And so the families of those they've purged have coming are coming to try and take revenge. Very quick establishment of a villain for this section. Just done. <laughs> the attack fails though, and we see the team of Inquisitors comes out using their torturous devices, even in a fight, and they are maybe demons? Like it's one of those things in Berserk where you're like, are you just a really big ugly person? And that's been a big thing in Berserk too, or are you some kind of horrible demon? I, I'm, I don't know, that's the thing. You're like, maybe little column A, maybe little column B. But they kill the prisoners they take from this ambush, essentially just preaching their zealotry all over the place, just throwing it about. God, God, I'm better than everyone because God. And Farnese, and I know that I might be saying her wrong because I saw a lot of people trying to correct my pronunciation in the last comment section. 
don't care. Gonna keep saying it how I say it. I don't give a frick! We see she's a bit shocked by the level of violence, but then some preaching McCaden happens. Miss Farnese, what manner of action dost thou feel is appropriate for these? And she responds, those who would plot to murder a priest usually weren't burning or breaking on the wheel. Categorically answered, just what I would expect from the glorious leader of the Holy Iron Chain Knights. Splendid insight. All she did was recommend burning people, my guy. Moreover, they are flagrant offenders. They have no defense. And we are pressed for time and cannot waste it on involvement with them. By my authority, I pass summary judgment upon them here. The sentence. All the accused are condemned to death by the wheel. And we see they have like a trademark thing, and it's to take wheels, break the shit out of people, attach them to the wheels, and leave them to die of like pain and exposure. Truly god awful and horrific. And Farnese, Farnese, Farasatan, she watches this horrific stuff and just starts sweating, and I can't entirely tell if she's having like regrets about this or if she is like into it and from what we learn later as i got further on in the story she's definitely into it in some messed up ways so not a fan of her this is bad lady bad woman but one of the prisoners is pushed forward and falls in front of casca and this is entirely just to show us casca's current situation because she is taken in by some prostitutes who protect her and that's how casca is managing to survive in this refugee camp they even bandage her up to make her look like she has syphilis so that no one will come near or touch her but then we cut to a child who is dealing with some ruffians turns out the kid's kind of smart he poisoned the ruffians good kid because they steal his food the poison makes him knocked unconscious other soldiers soldiers arrive, other soldiers are like, what happened here? Boy lies! The soldiers figure out that he lied, they're about to attack him when they're ambushed by some of the invaders who are attacking this country. During the attack though, right before they're about to come at the child, we see Guts arise, and of course he easily wipes them all out. The kid, seeing this, is like, damn, that guy's really impressive, I want to follow him, and I'm seeing a child character come into play. Don't... No. I do not, bad, do not like child characters. And these are some Aiel looking people. I'm just gonna put that out. They wear dark veils, they don't use swords, they have like knives and some speary things. Very Aiel-esque. I'm just putting that forward. They seem to be similarly inspired. I don't think there's even direct inspiration, just inspired from similar sources. But as Guts is leaving this fight and the child is following him, we see some of the leaders, assumedly from these foreign invaders, looking down on him and saying like, yeah, we could take them, but we're not going to right now because we're, we're busy. We're busy. Obviously, it's delivered in a much different tone than that, but straight up with the line, Is it acceptable, young master? Letting him go now. I don't mind. Our duty as... I can't say that word. I'm sorry. Dyslexia. Is to scout. It's not my intent to let a witness live, but there's no need for further sacrifice. So he's straight up saying like, Yeah, it's technically our job to kill that guy, but did you see how bad he was? I ain't f***ing with that! And I don't blame you. I wouldn't either. You made the right call. Smartest man of the day award for Berserk. That's something I'm gonna start awarding now. Every big chunk, I'm gonna say smartest person of the day. Bam, goes for that fella right there. But cutting back into the refugee camp, which we stay with again for quite some time, we see that like, a priest has been murdered, their hood is hanging from a tree as well as their flesh. So there is some hereticking going on. Personally, probably side with the heretics myself, but you know, there is hereticking. I'm just saying, if you have the priests who are torturing all kinds of people and like purging villages, and then some heretics who are killing those priests, I'm gonna be like, bad people, bad people killing bad people, Plus, as we'll see later on, they got a giant goat dude, and that's just cool. But a whole lot of images show us just how horrible the conditions in this refugee camp are. People are starving. And there's even a bit of an instance where some of the soldiers swarm the knights begging for food. And at first, it seems like things might actually go in a very bad direction. But the lead inquisitor, big man with the helmet face that turns out isn't a helmet, even though it really looks like it's a helmet. We see later it gets all veiny, so that's, that's his face, I guess. Stonehenge looking motherfucker. He is like, no, we'll bring in some of you, especially the mother with the child. Come on, come on. Come on, trust, trust me. Bring the baby. And to his credit, the baby is taken from the mother and it seems to be taken care of. And then he takes the mother into a torture chamber and she begins being tortured. And I'm not gonna lie, maybe Berserk has just desensitized me a lot. Maybe 
I've just seen a lot of torture chambers in fiction. Pretty mid torture chamber. Mid. 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 And we see Fairness Fairness is like averting her eyes, but the Inquisitor's like, nay, don't do that. You need to take it in. This hellish spectacle is one aspect of the Holy See to which you belong. God does not rain benevolence upon the earth. He is also a strict arbiter. Your typical Spanish Inquisition stuff. The Spanish Inquisition has arrived in Berserk. I'm a bit surprised, but I'm not shocked. <laughs> No, 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 no. I did expect it. We also get this face from the guy establishing, yeah, it's definitely not a mask. Although it doesn't affect his nose. And he's got, I think those are snot bubbles coming down, my guy. Not a, not a good look. Get a tissue. But from here we cut to the prostitutes once again and a non-violent directly sex scene where we're seeing a noble, as we know a lot of the soldiers in Holy Iron Chain Knights are nobles having sex with a prostitute who he then begins making all kinds of promises to in the cliche John manner of someone who falls in love with a prostitute and saying like, I can't marry you because of my status, but I'll make you one of my mistresses. We see then Casca peeks in on the sex that is happening, which startles the noble so much he kind of can't continue. And the scene ends with the noble giving the prostitute a gift and all those promises and of course as soon as he leaves she's like look at that jackass i swear if i took every sweet nothing i heard seriously i'd never make it as a prostitute yeah she's smart she understands the deal and the dummy of the day award goes to that noble but continuing just how intelligent this woman is knowing that if she was caught prostituting within the camp she would probably be then taken to the torture chambers and all the horrible things that are happening there she takes a lot of the gifts she has given and gives them to those around her geographically in the tent vicinity that way everyone's kept on the hush hush and while this prostitute's name is luca casca is going by the name Elaine because she still can't speak, so she's not told anyone, hey, my name's Casca. We also meet one last member of this group whose name is Nina, and she is required to take medicine due to, unfortunately, an STI, I think is the proper terminology now. Not STD anymore, I learned that in high school. Or has it switched back? I don't know. And Luca has procured her medicine, really showing that this woman is like a caregiver, someone who looks out for her whole group and is very intelligent. I hope she sticks around for a while. But we follow Nina for a little bit and we see she is really afraid of what is happening to her body due to this sickness, which I can only imagine back then, not knowing like what exactly diseases are, what they do to you, only seeing the side effects. That's genuinely terrifying. And just another layer to Berserk's psychological terror that I don't often consider in the modern world. But like, yeah, if you caught something that just rotted away or ate at your body or did things, holy sh**. But we also see some spirits or creatures looking over at Casca during this time. And we also see cut-ins of the child that her in Guts have that's like a deformed little fetus baby. So she's being looked after or threatened. Probably both. But from here we cut into the mess hall with a bunch of the soldiers within the Iron Holy Chain Knight Sea people. And morale is pretty low, at least when it comes to faith in their leader. They're openly questioning her credentials and actions within earshot of her. And it only stops when her second in command, the guy who actually almost equaled guts in a draw, comes in and accidentally purposefully spills some food to make them be like, shut the f shut the but Faranath goes to meet with the lead inquisitor and on the way runs into the guy wearing the like typical disease boy mask. And she actually sees even a couple of the other torturers out their masks off playing with birds. And their appearances are pretty upsetting, but the guy with the that 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 mask takes it off and he looks normal until he puts his hand in sunlight and we see that he has some kind of severe reaction to the sun where the sunlight blisters him like immediately. And in my mind, I went, oh, are you a vampire? I don't think so but maybe. And it turns out that all of the torturers under the lead inquisitor were like rejects from society that he has taken in under his wing, which gave me like half a second of like, oh, these guys, oh no, wait, they're awful. They're, never mind. I got sympathy from me for one heartbeat. And then I was like, never match no fuck you. But we cut into the actual lead inquisitor doing like those prayers where you harm yourself that a lot of times in fiction, you see like the most extreme religious zealots do, except his is just, He's face planting <laughs> on the, on the floor. I, I've looked at this like six times. That's what he's doing. I don't understand how it's not what he's doing. He's just throwing his face at the ground. I love you, God. <laughs> and we see that he's messed up his knees doing this so much he can't run anymore. I don't think God would want you 
to f up your knees. Like, I don't think God's up there being like, he hasn't, he hasn't done enough. I am, what? Speaking as someone who has helped their father recover from double knee replacement surgery, take care of them boys, okay? It's not fun. We then get a pretty typical religious zealot to religious zealot conversation where Faraneth asks him about why is it required to spread fear among people whose spirit is already so broken. And he gives a half story lecture that just essentially comes down to, religion's supposed to be painful. Don't question it or your faith. And yeah, that's about as deep as anything I expected from this guy and matches with the characterization. So great, good. We then have probably my least favorite sequence from this section of Berserk where we see Nina walking with Casca or Elaine and one of her Johns approaches her and essentially is like, I, nah, I want time. And she's like, no, I got a disease. Stop trying to sleep with me. I can't give you freebies anymore as well, which okay. But she then tells him like, look, if you love me, like you're implying now, meet me midnight tonight at this location. And he does go there. And she's surprised and is like, you came, come with me. Come with me and you'll be in a world of <laughs> And we see Casca, AKA Elaine now, another wheel of time thing. He's <laughs> following them towards wherever they're going. And there's also just like a Van Gogh sky of clouds above Casca. That's her world, how she sees it apparently. It's like, Gothic Van Gogh, I don't know how else to put that. Oh, sorry, it wasn't just Casca following. Casca is following Luca, who is following Nina. We got a little trail of followings here. But Nina takes this guy to a cave where there seems to be a bunch of heretics having an orgy and worshiping a giant goat guy. And hey, Vavitch. Not to mention there's also drugs in the smoke, so you start seeing weird hallucinations and visuals like a hand going through a titty. Kayla, do you have any thoughts on that? Nope. <laughs> and then, God, I'm gonna have to blur everything. There's just gonna be a demonetized symbol up. Jesus f***ing Christ, this is just porn and orgies and sex and a finger coming out of a... Oh! But after partaking in the orgy, we see the John Doe is taken to a food pot where they tried to serve him human. So, okay, you remember way back when, when I said I was on the heretic side, I... I, uh, not the cannibalism part. That's, okay, I'm at, mentally I'm like, am I more against torture or cannibalism when starving? And it's, I take, I, I, I take neither side. I'm on, I'm on my own side now is what I've decided. I would leave the fucking camp because I'm a boy scout and I could probably survive in the woods until a demon killed me. And at this point, I'm honestly thinking a demon killing me might be the best outcome here. Holy God. Of course, seeing the child in the pot, because it's clearly a child that I think is one of the children we've saw earlier. He is running from the cave and Nina's like, stop that man, he's gonna rat on us. And he runs from them to a point where he gets to a cliff. He then falls to his death. And Nina then tells her crew to leave her there because she wants to, I guess, I don't know, be alone looking down at the dead body of the guy who ran from her after the whole cannibalism orgy. She starts crying and being like, you big liar, you didn't love me. And I just want to put it out there. I love my girlfriend a lot. I very much so love Kayla. If I found her eating a baby, that's the, that's a line. That's a line that can't be crossed. But I think, I think Kayla would understand. Kayla understands. But Luca shows up after witnessing all of this and is like, Nina, what the hell? And instead of, I don't know, having a bigger reaction, she just spanks Nina and is like, bad. Um, excuse me. It ends with her hugging Nina going, you really are a silly girl. Absolutely not, ma'am. This character has been set up to be far too smart and practical to that be the extent of her reaction to someone being a part of a satanic cannibal orgy. <sighs> Girl, you worry me so. It's a little bit beyond worrying. I wanna make sure I got the series of events right. So she brought her friend to the cannibal orgy. They orgied, the cannibal part came up. So he ran, chase him down, he jumps off a ledge because he's tripping balls. Maybe the cannibal part wasn't real, but I looked back and it really seems like the cannibal part was real and not a part of the hallucination. Maybe I'm misinterpreting that. But after she is responsible for this man killing herself, Luca shows up and is like, you've been bad. And after Nina threatens to kill herself, the extent of Luca's anger 
and and distrust is a paddling. I don't get that. But she's leaving with Nina then, and they come across Costco, who also followed them, surrounded by some of these guys. And they're at first like, she's got syphilis, we're not gonna R-word her, which I was like, maybe finally Berserk will not have an R-word in a moment, there could be an R-word, but no, no, no. They tear the bandages off their face, and they tear open her clothes, and an R-word begins. Casca has flashes back to the terrible things that have happened to her, and then the spirits and demons come out, and feast on the satanic cannibals. Okay, am I more on the demon's side here now than anyone? I think that's what, no, I'm not, because they're even, I don't. Everything's painful. What I've decided, in this moment, I am pro-demon. After this moment, I am not pro-demon. I am not pro-cannibal orgy. I am not pro religious zealot knight. I'm kind of pro guts, though he needs some learning, some growth. Definitely pro Casca and pro Puck and Rickert and the blacksmith. Everyone else can rot in hell. But these spirits are led by Casca's fucked up fetus because you know, why not? And then we get Casca being praised as a witch goddess by the cannibal cult for bringing the demons. And we cut back to Guts, who apparently the child has been following him for a long time and tries to take the sword. Puck even is like, haha, use your legs, knowing like this kid can't pick up Guts' sword. And then Guts wakes up from this and picks up his own sword and is like, this ain't for kids, bro. This is, this is, this is real man sh I'm, a, I'm a masculine man. Grr. But his little bonding session with the kid is interrupted by a bunch of demons attached to wheels coming, which is a very clear sign that what the Inquisitors are doing is creating these demons somehow because they're on the wheels that the Inquisitors use. Sherlock Holmes that, and Guts handily destroys a bunch of them for tossing the child away and being like, get, get out of here, get, get, get out of here in the danger. But moving on from this fight away from the kid, Guts runs into our Skelly Horsey Boy. Love Skelly Horsey Boy. The Skelly Horsey Man just essentially tells Guts the same thing that happened before is being prepared to happen again. And someone connected to that side of awfulness is nearby, preparing for it. And he even says that someone who signifies the hawk is going to appear in this world. Power of gods descend to earth. The concentration of that idea is called the festival. And the festival is essentially a divine work. It traces a phenomenon into the divine domain. The flocking sheep who've been led to the blood-spattered holy ground desire the hawk of light. And you and that girl will come to throw yourselves into their midst. It's an attempt to imitate the eclipse. So it's not like the full eclipse, it's diet eclipse. I will say though, the dialogue for this guy, I'm feeling like was made clunky in translation. There's great dialogue in Berserk, and I feel like sometimes translation's an issue, and him being like, essentially it's gonna, like that doesn't feel right, with a lot of his other language being so flowery, and I wish that I could read it in the original Japanese to know how it originally hit versus how this translation's hitting. And we see Puck is reading Guts' emotions at this point and getting a better idea of what happened as well. And we also see that apparently Guts is not only afraid and angry, he's excited and other things that are positive. So Guts is, Guts is down and Guts pledges to save Casca this time by his own strength. Looking forward to it. The only thing I'm hoping is Zod makes an appearance at the party. It's not a party unless you have Nosferatu Zod. We cut to seeing Faranessa Fafasa's pass, and she apparently, I'm just gonna get this out of the way because we get it more clarified later on, I'm just gonna bring it in here. She apparently as a child would watch people outside of her window being burned alive as heretics. So she's got a long history of this and we see her now continuing to command these things. I had it spoiled for me for some people that there's like a big, Big arc with this character, I won't say because of spoilers, but I'm just fascinated to see how we're gonna get there. Also, thank you for that spoiler, people. We see someone though is trying to force a child into adding a torch to the fire that is burning that child's father, but Faramafafaha's second in command, I think his name is like Serpicio, Serpicio, stops this and apparently he himself, we see after he goes on break and talks with the noble who was with the prostitute before, says that he had to watch his own parent burned at a young age three years ago. And so yeah, he, he had sympathy for that kid. We also see that noble, I think his name is Jerome, Jer Jeremy, it's a J name. It's literally right here on the page. I'm not going to look to frustrate the people who get mad at me about names. <laughs> we see him being like, 
three years ago, it couldn't be. And I'm like, wait, the eclipse? What around the, uh, uh huh? But this section ends with the clarification of what exactly the childhood of Ferrum Fffa was like, and she is pleasuring herself to... Moving on to the seventh deluxe edition. <sighs> we see after, I guess, some time has passed, Casca's become a bit of a religious beacon for people who don't exactly believe in what the tortures are doing, but are still a part of the refugee camp. They're bringing offerings to Casca and Luca. And of course, Luca, being the intelligent person she once was yet again, is like, this is super dangerous and we can't have people bring all this stuff because eventually the heretic hunters will find us. Also, heretic hunters. Great name for a band. Nina tries to be like, let's just get rid of Elaine Koska because she's gonna get us all killed. And of course, Luca's like, I will hit you again. But there's a commotion outside and we see Luca sees it is one of her own being taken to the awful place. And she knows one, if this person is taken, their gig is up. And two, uh, you know, let's not let my friend have this stuff done to her. So she goes to intervene and this happens to be right when Guts shows up because things are escalating. It looks like they're about to go really poor for Luca. And then this jumped up noble in armor has to deal with the black swordsman. And I'm not gonna lie, Despite this not being my favorite section of Berserk so far, the moment Guts showed up, I just went. <laughs> <laughs> like there was just this like, this is gonna be good. This is gonna be very, very good. I like where this is gonna go. They're gonna die. And of course they're all freaking out like, oh my God, it's the Black Swordsman. And Guts takes the captain by the face and is like, have you seen a woman with a brand on her chest? And the guy's like, oh no. And so Guts just throws him to the side and the fight begins. One swing of his sword, of course, Guts takes down men and horses because Guts kills a lot of horses. That actually upsets me. The captain who Guts threw aside orders his men not to falter and to attack. And the boy shows up to Luca and says, the way you lit into my guy, that was so cool. I think I'm in love. To which Luca responds, who's the monkey? And calling a little boy a monkey. That. That'd be a blow to my ego as a child. But Puck comes forward and says like, oh, he's with me. And so's that guy. I'm their owner. Puck, they're laters to you and I like them. The final shot we get though is of Guts saying, I know Casca's here somewhere. And the look on his face makes me think he's prepared to literally butcher his way through the entire refugee camp until he gets to Casca. And at first I was like, nah. Guts wouldn't do that. That's crazy. And then I remembered who Guts was and I was like, Guts would absolutely do that. Guts is crazy. <laughs> um, there's some highs to this sequence of Berserk for sure. I really like the overall atmosphere that's being built and the setup for this Inquisitor villain. Very solid. Some of the setup for it though is feeling kind of shaky and rushed. A continual problem I'm having with some of Berserk and the violence towards women. Yes, the way it's continually being framed is bothering me. What I'm really hoping for though, and what I need to see here is Casca regaining some of her agency. I get what happened to her. Arguably the worst thing I've ever seen happen to a fictional character, but the strength in that character is enough to overcome it and hopefully have some return to form. I am craving that big time. Overall though, for this section of Berserk, I'm feeling a soft six out of 10. Overall though, still very much so enjoying Berserk. I hope you all liked a little bit more of a fast paced go through here. At this rate, it's gonna be about two videos per deluxe edition and we should be done by the end of the year. Exciting things. Stay tuned for Chainsaw Man this weekend and have a good one, y'all. I got merch, I got books, peace.